Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our second series in our winter lectures. I have to talk about a little housekeeping issues first. Please turn off your cell phones. Turn off the ringers. I want to let you know that tonight's event is being sponsored by the Bayside History Museum, the Calvert Library, and the John Hanson Society Daughters of the American Revolution. We particularly want to thank the John Hanson ladies. All the snacks in the back and all the waters are from the Daughters of the American Revolution. We want to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mickey, would you stand? We want to thank Mickey Hummel. He is on our town council in North Beach and has always been available to help us YouTube, record, and save all of these lectures for the future. We also, we couldn't do anything, Robin. I'm going to ask you to stand for a minute. <laughs> Robin Truslow is in the back. She's counter library. Honestly, we couldn't. Anyone who's ever had a chance with IT, she's sold it. Ralph Eshelman. Ralph is a specialist in polar exploration, military, maritime history, the War of 1812 in the Chesapeake, geology, and vertebrate paleontology. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan with a major in geology and vertebrate paleontology and a minor in ecology. I smiled yesterday when I read the news that the endurance had been found in the Antarctic 106 years after the historic ship had been crushed and packed in ice and sank during an expedition by the explorer, Ernest Shackleton. I was like, oh, I bet that was really hard to get back to the Antarctic. But uh, he's best known in this area for being the first director of the Calvert Marine Museum in Sunnyvale, and the citizens of this county are so fortunate to have such a wonderful facility like the Calvert Marine Museum in their midst. Ralph is the owner of Eshelman and Associates, which is a cultural resource management consulting firm. He's a partner in Lighthouse Preservation Firm. He was a consultant with the National Park Service during the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812 in the Chesapeake, which resulted in the publication of five books. Tonight, Ralph is sharing the Patuxent, an encyclopedic pictorial history of Maryland's Forgotten River, with the hopes that the publication of this book, which is being published by the Calvert Marine Museum, will be available by 2023. So without further ado, we're honored tonight to have Dr. Ralph Well, thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. When you look at all of my qualifications, you might wonder, what is this guy doing here talking about the Patuxent River? But before we get into that, I just want to thank all of you for being here. Wonderful turnout, not a particularly great evening. Uh, but for all of you in the front rows up here, you get gold stars. <laughs> You're the best students, right? Okay. We're going to talk about the Patuxent River. And this is all leading into a book that I've been working on that Grace Mary talked about. And there's just no way that I can cover everything that's going to be in that book because every day I find something new. It's just absolutely amazing. It's a, it's a wonderful river. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, I'm very informal, so feel free to ask questions or whatever. I'm starting out with these two photographs in juxtaposition with one another because the photograph on the upper right was taken in 1908. And I don't know if any of you can recognize it, but that's up in Laurel. Now remember, the Patuxent River is 115 miles long. We live, most of us here, down in the southern part, which is very different from the river up in the northern part. And in this book, I'm trying to cover everything, so you can imagine, it's a major, major task. The picture on the left is 1958. That's at Benedict. That's the old Captain's Inn. You might remember it better as the Henderson Inn, or the hotel. Look at the difference in 50 years, the way the people are dressed. I mean, it's just amazing. And we've already gone another 50 years since the picture on the lower left. 
and think about what it's going to be like in another 50 years beyond that. It's, a, it's pretty amazing. And I threw this photo in. This is by Dave Hart. Many of you may know Dave. He's a phenomenal photographer. He works for the, uh, Jay, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Journal. And he came across this image, and you might be able to make out on the stern. That's the Miss Patuxent. That's the only vessel I've ever been able to find that was called the Miss Patuxent. And unfortunately, she's not around anymore. But this is from the St. Mary side, looking across over to the Calvert County side. Now, I've done this lecture, not in this form, but many times before. I always like to start out with a quote from Paul Vilscratch, who did a, a book in 1931 called The Tidewater Maryland and its history and tradition. And I'm just going to read this, and you can go along with me. I find it very fascinating. 1931, he said, there is no established allure about the Patuxent River. It is little known. It has neither cult nor a it is the most sparsely inhabited and least known, probably of all the rivers of Tidewater, Maryland. It is not in the pathway of any flow of human life. Neither commerce nor tourism has disturbed it. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know if that strikes any nerve with you guys, but that's not the Toxic River that I know, for sure. Now, this is a scene taken from the air of the mouth of the Toxic River. And Kent Mountford, who's right over here, he's the guy that got me this photograph. And for a lot of people, it may be hard for you to figure out what we're looking at. But you can see the eastern shore up on the top. <coughs> and then if you look very, very carefully, if I can get the cursor to come up. There we go. Right there is Cedar Point. Right there is Solomon's Island. Right there is the Thomas Johnson Bridge. Right here is the Benedict Bridge. And there's the Chalk Point Power Line. That's a very unusual kind of an image of a place that we all know very well. But you know, it's the watershed. This book is not just about the river, it's also about the Patuxent watershed. So if you look up at the top, which is the beginning of the river, that's Mount Airy. This is Urbana, which is not within the Patuxent River, but it's near the beginning of the Patuxent River. This is an amazing river, and all of it is within the confines of the state of Maryland. It's the largest intrastate river in Maryland. This is a photograph that came out of the Calvert Recorder, 2002. <coughs> this building no longer stands, nor is that sign that is there. But this is up near the headwaters, and it's on what is known as Ridge Road. And Ridge Road comes right out of Mount Airy, some of you have probably been on it. And that's the drainage divide between the Potomac and the Patuxent. That's why it's called Ridge. And if you look down on the sign, look at how they spell Patuxent. <laughs> I didn't know there were those cultural differences between the northern part of the river and the southern part of the river. Now this is a, a map from 1862, this is from the National Archives, but this shows you the very beginnings of the Patuxent River, right up and through here. So Mount Airy is up in this area. And how did they spell the Patuxent here? P-A-W. And this, if you look at history, you'll see it's spelled many different ways, uh, pretty much all the time. Now, where that pointer is showing you up near Mount Airy, this is where I'm standing right now. I shouldn't say right now, in this image. <laughs> and you can see that I can stand on either side of the shoreline of the upper Potomac River. It's pretty amazing. And not only that, but the water is just crystal clear. And if I stepped in the water right there, I wouldn't even get my hands wet. That's how shallow it is. Now imagine doing that down here near the mouth of the river. Totally different environment than what it's like up near the mouth. And I'm not going to read this to you, except that the Maryland Geological Survey in 1985 came out with their own definition of where the mouth, or where the beginning of the Patuxent River is. And they said it's Quentin Day Farm. And one of my expeditions is going to go to Quentin Day Farm, so I can say I've been there. <laughs> These are a bunch of photographs by a friend of mine by the name of Robert Garagas. And you can see his photos online. He lives on the Patuxent River, kind of what they call the fork between the Patuxent and the Little Patuxent River. 
And these are some of the photographs that he's taken up in that section. So we're talking about the Patuxent River in the Piedmont. We live down in the coastal plain. We're in the tidewater portion of the river. This is the freshwater, non-tidal portion of the river. And it's beautiful. Not that it is a beautiful river. But these are just a few of his images. I'm trying to convince him to allow me to put these in the park. So with your good wishes, hopefully that's going to happen. I once asked him what was the most important thing that he knew about photography. And his answer was amazing. Hip waders. He said, to get these photographs, you've got to get out on the river. And how many of us, we stand on the shoreline, and maybe we want to go in this way, but he doesn't do that. He is out in the river, and that's how he's gotten these images. Now, let's go to the other extreme. This is Point Patience. I think everybody in this room knows what Point Patience is. And you can see the difference in the colors represents the depth of the water. The darker the blue, the deeper the water. And you'll see that those darkest color blues are 40 meters or more in depth. So think about where I was standing at the beginning of the river, less than ankle deep, and now we're talking about water that's over 127 feet deep. Big, big difference. And I don't have time to go into everything I'd like to go into, but rivers tend to meander. They actually move like this. They swerve back and forth. And what you're looking at here is a former meander of the Patuxent River that's now been cut off. And then here's another meander down through here. And the Patuxent was used as one of the early studies on the difference between river meandering in the tidewater area versus the Piedmont area. So it's actually been a scientific proving ground to help people to better understand what meandering of a river is all about. The river does not run free. There are many dams on the river. How many of you have gone up I-95 and probably didn't even realize, but just to the north, you're looking at the Howard Duckett Dam and Reservoir. This is providing fresh water to many hundreds of thousands of homes in that area, all coming out of the Texas River. If you go up even further, up near what is now the Tri-Delphia Reservoir, there's a second dam up there. And you can actually go out on the road, and the road will take you right straight across the top of that dam. And I'm going to come back to this at the end of the uh, program, but there's a little place right in here that if you've never visited, you need to visit when the azaleas are going to be coming in bloom. And that's not too far away from where we are right now. It's one of the most beautiful places on the Patuxent River. But there's also dams that exist that are no longer there. Anybody want to guess where this is? This is Laurel, Maryland. Laurel and Savage had two huge cotton mills. I mean huge mills that competed with the mills up in, in New England. And this is the, the dam right here. And then this is the mill race where the water from behind that dam would come down and then power the mill. So imagine these huge mills that were being powered by the river of the Patuxent River. This is the dam that was located in Savage. And if you want to go to one of the standing mill buildings that's still extant, you need to go to Savage. It's turned into a big, kind of like a, uh, an antique center, but it, it's just an amazing place to go visit. But there's other dams as well that you may not be familiar with. This is Lake Elkhorn. Uh, this is in the community of Columbia. You know, most of the people that live in Columbia don't realize that they're in the Patuxent River watershed, but they are. People that live in Crofton, you're in the Patuxent River watershed. People that live in Beltsville, I mean, it's amazing the size of this river. And then anybody recognize this in the lower right-hand corner? That's right here in Calvert County. That's Lake Laurier. That's in Chesapeake Beach Estates. It used to be known as the Chesapeake Ranch Club. <coughs> and then, have you ever thought about cliffs? We all know about Calvert Cliffs. But if I didn't tell you, you probably would think that that's a, a view of Calvert Cliffs from the Chesapeake Bay. This is Drum Cliff. This is on the Patuxent River. This is St. Mary's County. 
So we have a river that has all kinds of diversity that people that live here oftentimes don't even appreciate. These are some early maps. The one on the left is 1816, the one on the right is 1836, and you can see Holland's Cliffs. And this is what Holland's Cliffs look like today. Now, they're not eroding as fast as they used to, and because of that, there's a lot of vegetation that covers it. But if you take all of that vegetation away, you could not tell the difference between that and Calvary Cliffs. That's how significant those cliffs are. And then this is me standing at the contact, I don't want to get into heavy geology, but the Calvert Formation, where all the Miocene fossils come from, that's right up above my hat. And below it is the Eocene, which is an earlier formation. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. But this is near Hall Creek. This is right on the Patuxent River, very close to where Hall Creek comes in, in Calvert County. And look at the size of that cliff. It's amazing. And then, this is one of my favorite, I should tell you this, fossil collecting sites. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you where it is, but it's on the river. And you, here you can see the West Area that was in full bloom. What a beautiful place to be. And then finally, any of you that have ever gone to Patuxent Park, when you come into that entrance road, and just before you get to the visitor center, this is the cliff that's located right there. And the reason that cliff is there is that that's where one of the meanders of the river has cut into a high terrace, which has allowed that to erode away, and therefore you have this tremendous outcrop. How about waterfalls? How many people in this room have been about waterfalls? It's near Dunkirk. It's not very far from where we are right now, but you've got to know where it is. And there's a Girl Scout group they are getting ready to do an interpretive trail to take people to this waterfall. So soon it will be much more apparent to everyone that's there. This is another waterfall. And the height of that individual there is just short of six feet. Now this is in the dry season. This was in the fall. But this is located over uh, at the local wildlife refuge. So it's really, when you think about it, not that far away from Dunkirk. They're kind of opposite each other. But we have many waterfalls. You just don't know where they are. You've got to get out of the, <clears throat> the roads and pavement and whatnot to get to see them. Now, this is an aerial. And you might be thinking, ah, it doesn't look like the Patuxent River to me. But this is the Patuxent River. This is a drainage of the Patuxent River going through some of the Cretaceous clays. The Cretaceous is the age of the dinosaurs. There's actually dinosaur fossils found in these clays. And the reason that this has been exposed is that all the trees were cut down and it was going to be made into a landfill. And then lo and behold, the person went bankrupt. And so now it's been eroding ever since. And it's been referred to as the sand desert. Now it's private property, um, but that doesn't mean you can't get a drone to go in there and take a look at it. And that's what you're looking at here. Now, everybody can see that this says the city of Baltimore. Everybody can see that this is made out of stone. My question to you is, where did the stone come from, and where is this? And you might say, well, it's the city of Baltimore. It's got to be in Baltimore. And in fact, you can even see the monument there. That's known as Babylon Monument. It still stands in the entered city of Baltimore. This, my friends, is located in the Washington Monument. If you've ever had the pleasure of walking down <coughs> the staircase, instead of taking the elevator up and down, they have all these different commemorative stones and memorials by all the different states and the major cities in, in the United States. And the one from Baltimore is made out of Guilford granite, which is from the Patuxent River. And if you look at the buildings down below, the Baltimore Custom House, the U.S. Capitol, not all of it, but part of it, and the U.S. Treasury Building, were made out of Guilford granite from the Patuxent River. And this is a kind of a close-up of what that granite looks like. And then this just kind of tells you that this particular piece that I've taken a picture of here was on exhibit at the 1901 Pan American Exposition. Back then, the Geological Survey for the state of Maryland was so proud of the products that we had here in the state they were promoting them by going to festivals. 
all around the world, but primarily in the United States. And so what you're looking at here on the left is one of their exhibits that was put together by the state of Maryland. And this is at the Pan American Exposition, which was held in Buffalo. And then if you read down lower, you can see they received a gold medal from the exposition for the exhibit that they had done. They also displayed at the West Indian Exposition, which was held in Charleston, South Carolina. That was in 1902. And also the Louisiana Purchase Expedition, Exposition, which was in St. Louis in 1904. And then you see off to the right, these are two glass globes. And in it, they have matrix. And the matrix on the left is known as a green sand, which was quarried as a fertilizer. And right there on the label, it says Charles County. And I know exactly where this, that sample came from. It came from the Tuxent River. The one on the right, you might be able to read it. You can see it's full of fossil shells. Exactly the same kind of fossil shells you'll see in Calvert Cliffs. But you also have those same outcrops on the Patuxent River. <clears throat> this particular label right here says St. Mary's. I cannot prove it because there's no definitive answer as to where that sample came from. But almost certainly that came from Jones Wharf, what we better know as Drum Cliff. And the reason I say that is that St. Mary's, the only other place that you can get close to something like that is in St. Mary's River at Millstone Point. And I don't think they would have gone there because it's kind of an out of the way place. It's more likely that they got it right through the Tyson River. So imagine, we have these samples that have been displayed in expositions all over the world right here from good old Patuxent River. And then think of some of the scientists that have come down here and collected in the Patuxent River. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Hope, but there was this big deal about the, the dinosaur wars where there were these vertebrate paleontologists who were fighting one another. Well, one of them was Cope. And Cope was affiliated with the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. And he came down to the Patuxent and he specifically went to a marl pit that was being dug at Delabrook. I know the folks over here know where Delabrook is. Delabrook is on the Tuxent River on the St. Mary's County side. And he went there because they were finding fossils. And he described some of those fossils. And this is an illustration that shows you some of the fossils that came out of that pit. These are among some of the earliest fossils that were professionally collected in the United States, and they came from the Patuxent River. Many people don't know that. Now you're looking at some shells. For those of you who collect fossils along Calvert Cliffs, you probably have picked up shells just like this. But if you look at the label down at the bottom, it says Jones Wharf, Patuxent River. Jones Wharf is right next to Grand Cliff. That's the cliffs that I showed you earlier. So these collections right here came from probably St. Mary's County in 1889 and 1890. And they are now on display at the Wagner Free Institute. And this is one of these classical early museums where they haven't changed anything from what it was like when they first opened. And so you can still go in there and see what the exhibits are like. And this is a non-contemporary illustration of what that building looks like, which by the way, is in, it's in a very bad part of Philadelphia. Uh, it's near Temple University. But if you want to have an experience and you want to go in and see some fossils collected from the Patuxent River, that's the place to go, right there. Now you can't get a sense of the size, but Mesozoic is a geological term that means the age of the dinosaurs. And what you're looking at here are the internal molds of different types of cephalopods. And believe it or not, these were cephalopods that were collected in Prince George's County within the watershed of the Tuxen River. And these are some of the best preserved cephalopods that have ever been collected in the United States. Most of them came from near the Redskins Park Stadium when it was built. A lot of that was dug out and some of those best deposits were exposed at that time. Now I'm gonna go from these animals that are about a foot and a half in diameter up to two feet in diameter to the right hand side these are microscopic little animals. They came from a different formation, but also in Prince George's County. And the reason I wanted to show it to you is that the species name is, is named after Prince George's County. Think about that. How many counties 
have a fossil in the river. And these are fossils all collected from the Tuxedo River. And this is a blow up. I mean, can't you imagine how proud the people from PG County must be? <laughs> and then how many of you might have ever thought that Charles Darwin, we can't prove this for sure, but we know that Charles Darwin, when he did his study of barnacles in 1854, one of the fossils that he studied was from Maryland. And that's all it says. It just says Maryland. And if you look at the bottom left-hand image, that's the image of that particular specimen that he published in his monograph. And if you look at the right, these are images of the same types of barnacles that we have from Calvert Cliffs and also from some of the outcrops on the Patuxent River. Just like that previous example I told you about, there's one other place where possibly Darwin could have gotten the specimen, and that's on St. Mary's River. But more likely, it probably came from Grum Cliff. And I keep referring to Grum Cliff because we have evidence of paleontologists coming to those cliffs because they were using the steamboats. They were coming by steamboat from Baltimore, and they were getting off at Jones Wharf and then going to Drum Cliff to collect. Now, I can't say positively that Darwin's barnacle from Maryland came from the Patuxent. But what I can say is that it's very likely. That's kind of cool. How long have humans been in the watershed? I know this is not a great photograph, but this is from a report in 2013. And what you're looking at is a cobble. And if you look closely, it appears as if that cobble has been used as a hammerstone. You can see where the natural erosional surface, which is smooth, has been roughened up by a concussion, where it's been used to beat against something. Now, that could happen naturally in a stream bed, maybe, but notice how it seems to be all around the very edge and nowhere else. Every archaeologist that I have talked to would say to you that that looks very likely, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say definitively, that looks very likely that it was human use. Where did it come from? It came from the mouth of the Patuxent River. And where did it was found in situ? And a paleosol. A paleosol means a former soil that has now been buried. And that paleosol has been dated at 20,000 years. So it's possible that humans have been in the Patuxent for at least 20,000 years. And you may just have seen recently they have some human footprints that they found out in White Sands National Monument. And they dated those at between 21 and 22,000. There is more and more evidence all the time that there were probably pre-Clovis people living in the New World than what has been accepted in the past. What I can tell you definitively is that we do have Clovis points from the Patuxent River. And these are two examples. The one on the left is from near Jug Bay. This is called Pendell Bluff. That's another cliff, by the way. And then the one on the right, this is uh, called Garrett's Chance. And that's near Swan Creek. Um, Swan Creek actually starts in Charles County, but it moves into uh, St. Mary's County, and that particular site was in St. Mary's County. There's no doubt in anybody's mind that there were Clovis people. By Clovis, I mean between 10 to 12,000 years ago, living in the Patuxent watershed. This is from Pig Point. Some of you might think of Pig Point as Bristol, but that's further up near the Anne Arundel border, up in that area. All of these shark's teeth came out of an archaeological site. And that's not uncommon. The first people to collect fossils were not people like you and me. They were the prehistoric peoples that were collecting the fossils because they were curious, but also they could use them as tools. So look at these shark's teeth, particularly on the left. They're already pointed. They're perfect for like making holes in leather, for example. And look at the big shark's teeth, the meg teeth that some of you may be familiar with. Some of these are big enough that they fit into the palm of your hand and they make perfect scrapers. They're just ideal for that. So instead of you taking stone and working it, making it into a tool, here you have tools that are already pre-adapted to be used. And they're being found more and more throughout archaeological sites, not just in the Patuxent River, but throughout the Chesapeake Bay. There's only two palisaded Indian sites known in the state of Maryland. One of them is on the Potomac River, and the other one, you got it, Patuxent River. 
Not one has ever been found on the eastern shore. And what you're looking at here are two different images, which is known as the, uh, the uh, Cumberland site. Uh, the Cumberland site is like a mile from where I live, and I can walk to the site. There's a house, unfortunately, that's built on top of it. But the guy who used to own that property, he allowed the archaeologists to come in and do their study before he built his house. This is what they discovered. And then this is just a, an excavation plan that shows you how that palisades had kind of this curve. And what's interesting is that the palisade was built at the end of a, near the end of a point. So the point that was jetted out into the Patuxent River provided defense. And then the palisade provided the land entrance to that point. If we went to the American Civil War, can you imagine how that disrupted the steamboat service in the Patuxent River? And what you're looking at here is the steamboat Patuxent that was owned by the Weeps. And it was the first steamboat that was confiscated by the Union during the Civil War. And it was used to transport soldiers, which is what you can see here. You can see soldiers all over on board that vessel. And then in its later years, it was used as a hospital supply boat. This is the vessel that would go from like Baltimore, pick up medical supplies, and bring them down to all the different military hospitals that were located in the Chesapeake. But if you were dependent upon steamboats during the Civil War, it was so disruptive it was very difficult to get from one place to another. Just to give you an idea of the, the wealth of information that is out there, this is a drawing, a sketch of Laurel Station. And if you look right here, this is where the railroad goes across the Patuxent River. And this is where the main road between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. went across the Patuxent River. And up here, if you can read it very well, you can see the 141st New York. That was their encampment. And up here was another New York encampment. And right here, you can see a fort that was built. And then down here, you can see cannon emplacements that were put there to protect the railroad bridge. The bridges were the weakness in the railroad. So there were Confederates that were coming into this area. There were also sympathizers that were trying to destroy the railroad. If you want to learn more about that, if you read Don Stromet's book, Don's right over here. He's got a 730-page book on <laughs> Southern Maryland and the, and the uh, uh, Civil War. I mean, it's it's light reading. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine a submarine like I'm showing here? They came into the Patuxent River, yeah. but it did. In 1898, this is Simon Lakes. Anybody that's ever done research on submarines, you, you've heard of Simon Lakes. He was one of the pioneers. And it was built in Baltimore, and you can see that on the left. This is before it was actually launched. And what I wanted to point out to you is that it was meant to go on the bottom of the river and the Chesapeake Bay and even the ocean floor. And so these two wheels you see in the front is what gave it stability. But the wheel on the back could actually be moved. It was like a tiller, but it was a wheel. And so by turning that wheel, that's how it maneuvered across the bottom. And then you can see a big propeller out of the back. That's what propelled it through the water. And then look up here, exhaust pipe from the internal engine. You don't want all of that exhaust fume inside. And then here's your inflow fresh air coming down from the surface. So the limiting factor of the submarine is that you couldn't go below depths to the extent of fresh air and your exhaust. This is an artist's conception of it exploring the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay. This is what it looks like when it is afloat. And it isn't it interesting that it looks like a boat? So this what that you see right here is this section right there. And then this right here would be the uh, fresh water, I'm sorry, the fresh air vent that went on down. And then this is the route from Baltimore. And here you can see the Patuxent River. Here's Solomon's. This is where it came in and spent two days and explored the Patuxent River. They found two shipwrecks in the Patuxent River. And they laid a cable across the mouth of the Patuxent River. Pretty amazing stuff. Anybody want to guess what this is? Or even where it is? 
Old Boy Road. There's a, there's a double A over there. This is right opposite of Nottingham. So this is on the Calvert County shore. Nottingham's on the St. Mary shore. And this was a road that was built across the marsh so that you could take a shorter ferry route to get to the other side of the river. And this was done just this January on a day when it was just, I think it was like 31 degrees with no breeze, but we had a blowout the day before. And so all of this was exposed. And Dave Lithicum, who is a cartographer that's been helping me on the book, this is a detail of what the corridor road looks like. We went out in kayaks to document this. This is an aerial that uh, Dave got together for me. And you might be able to make out all the logs that have been laid down here parallel to one another. And then on top of those logs, they would put down dirt and one another. That would be your road that went across the marsh. And then this is actually shows the road going across the marsh. And this is in a U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey map from 1908. So it's this kind of fun stuff that I enjoy going out and exploring this room. I'm not going to read all of these to you, but everybody in this room I know is aware that Patuxent River oysters have been famous. Patuxent brand oysters have been very famous in the past. On the left, you can see a Waynesboro, Pennsylvania advertisement from 1868. Right down here at the bottom, it says the best oysters in the world. Patuxent? It might be a little bit of an embellishment. <laughs> it's there. And then up here, you can see Patuxent River oysters. Down here, you can talk about, it says, the highest prevailing locality are asked for the Oh, the highest, yeah, locally, people are asking for Patuxent River oysters. They're more expensive, but they're worth it. And these are just different, um, Restaurants in Washington, D.C., and up in Columbia, and places like that that have advertised their tux and oysters. This is not easy to see, but this is a label from an oyster king. And I know you can't read it very well, but that says Cove Oysters, and right here, that says Isaac Solomon's and Sons. And right down here is Solomon's Island. This can label dates from 1874. 1875. If you look over on this part of the label, it says San Francisco. These were oysters that were harvested in the Tuxent River. They were canned by Solomons and Sons in Solomons, Maryland, and sent probably by rail to California, where they were then sold by this firm. And this particular label was found on a can in a gold mine. In California. So a gold miner took a can of oysters into the mine, and this was probably his lunch. And the museum is very fortunate to have that. There's a copy of the label on display if you want to take a look at it. And I just wanted to show you here's the, the gold mine area in California, and then of course this is where we're located here. It's probable that it went by the rail. It's also possible it could have gone by sailing ship to the Panama Isthmus, then gone across the Isthmus, picked up by another ship, and then taken back up, or it could have come down all the way around Cape Horn. Because it was canned, it wasn't that big a deal. Those oysters were going to last for months, if not for a year or so. But we don't know for sure how it got there. Now, as phenomenal as it is for a Patuxent oyster to be found in California, how many of you know that Patuxent oysters were fed on New Year's Eve dinner at Little America in Antarctica. When Admiral Byrd was doing his scientific investigations there, he wanted to have a special dinner for the researchers and the people that were there, including a Boy Scout who was 16 years old. And that night, they had oysters from Tuxedo River shipped by J.C. Lord on Sundays. They were obviously keen. How many of you have ever been to the Grand Central Terminal Oyster Bar in New York City? If you haven't been there, you're missing a tree. <laughs> but if you look at the lighting fixtures, anybody see anything that looks a little interesting there? <clears throat> That's the William B. Tennyson. Oh. Now, 
I'll be the first to admit it's not an exact replica. <laughs> but in the restaurant, there's a label that talks about all of those different vessels that you see in the lighting fixtures. And it identifies the one of them showing you right here as the William B. Tennyson. And William B. Tennyson is a National Historic Landmark. That's the highest level of preservation you can get according to the federal government. And because of that, I'm sure the designer went online and said oyster boats. And one of the first things that popped up would be a National Register, William B. Tennyson. And that's how we ended up with this particular light fixture in the uh, Grand Central Station. We have some folks from Soderley over here. Yeah. And this is, I didn't know you were going to be here, but thank you for coming. You guys already know about this, but as early as 1957, St. Mary's County Development Committee came up with a great idea. Why don't we supply a turkey as well as oysters from the Patuxent River and give them to the President of the United States? It's not that far away. The White House is just a few hours drive back in those days. And they did that for many, many years. And you're looking at a photograph here. Uh, this is 1984. This is Arthur Buck Briscoe. And you can see on the right, Patuxent River Oyster Can. And then if you look very closely, it says, Rush Perishable Dressed Turkey. And then down at the bottom, Soderley Farms, Hollywood, America. And they did this for many, many presidents up until 1984. They don't do it anymore. I don't know why. Maybe they're getting oysters from some places. Who knows? Just to give you an example of the, the variety of places where oysters have been canned on the Patuxent River. This is on the left. And you can still get good old Patuxent oysters in many places uh, today, including Island Grill oysters. We just had some of the show nets. Uh, two months ago, something like that. I think it was around uh, Thanksgiving. And watermen still work in this river. Uh, this is Ealing. Can you make out the uh, Benedict Bridge in the background there? This is fike net fishing. Many people have never seen fike net fishing. But this is very common, particularly up in the lower Marlboro and further up the river. And here you can see catfish and perch and just all kinds of stuff in there. And I'm going to throw a shout out here because these photographs were by Benjamin Wilson. And I don't know if anybody here knows Benjamin Wilson. I've been trying to get hold of this guy because I'd like to be able to use his photographs. I think they're really nice in my book, but I can't get hold of them. If anybody knows this guy, I'd appreciate hearing about him. But how many of you eat muskrat? And how many of you know that they still eat muskrat? And this is an example. This is uh, about a three-year-old photograph. This is from Robot Williams, who's freely shared all of his fishing photographs and stuff like that. There's people like that that really make it very well for um, Famous people who have been on the river, don't have the time to go into it, there's just so many. But you know the Longitude, which was the favorite sailing vessel of President Kennedy, it was built in Solomon's, Maryland, at the M.M. Davis shipyard. And there's a photograph, I should have thrown it in here and I didn't, but it showed all the workers standing next to the Longitude when she was about ready to be launched. And some of those workers <coughs> ended up working at the Calvert Green Museum as volunteers in the very early years of the establishment of that museum. People like Pepper Langham. I mean, it's just amazing. And there she is on the right-hand side. And she's now in private ownership, and she's still sailing. I wanted to show you, this is the Windward. And this is a beautiful, beautiful vessel built 1928, designed by Philip Rhodes. Philip Rhodes is one of the, the senior designers of, of fine yachts in the United States. And it was built at the Emmer Davis shipyard. And what a lot of people may not know is that that vessel was donated to the Calvert Museum. And it's in it's dry storage. It's never been put on display. And when you go to the Marine Museum, as great a museum as it is, People don't realize that some of the best yachts ever built in this country came out of the M.M. Davis shipyard. And they've got the hall of the wind. And maybe if we all got together, we could encourage the museum to get this thing, pull it out. Let's get this thing restored and put it on exhibit. I'm not saying put it back in the water. It'd be too expensive to do that. But to have this for people to see and appreciate, to me, it's, it's, it would be a wonderful thing. How about the cruise along? This was the first assembly line vessel built for the moderate income individual in the United States. 
right here in good old Calvert County on the Tuxen River. And the museum has done a good job of interpreting that. But what I wanted to particularly show you many <laughs> is that you talk about advertisements. M.M. Davis, when they were doing cruise alongs, they had a show store in New York City on Fifth Avenue. And when I Love Lucy did two different episodes where they promoted these vessels. Now, they didn't physically come to the Patuxent, but the vessels that were on display in New York is what they got in and, and did these advertisements. Anybody want to guess what this is? That's a myth. To my knowledge, this is the first drawing that's ever been done in the Texas watershed. And it's 1813. It's really not that early when you think about it. But it's by Benjamin Henry Latrobe. And so we're talking about War of 1812 is going to come. And here's Latrobe coming down here, visiting, and doing these sketches, and this particular one, of a mill at Upper Marlboro. And if you look on the left, this area back in here, that doesn't look like Upper Marlboro today. <laughs> and unfortunately, the mill's not here either. But how many of you thought about this? Have you ever thought to yourself, how did they come up with the design of the exhibition building at the Calvert Museum? Because it's not really the typical kind of a design. And what you're looking at is the old tomato kind that was located in Solomon's. And when the firm, which is called Cambridge 7, came down and did the master plan for the Marine Museum. They wanted to make the building at least somewhat architecturally appropriate for the area, even though I think you could say today there's a lot of buildings that have been built down there that are not in keeping with the historic integrity of the island. But that was their desire to do that. I'll leave it up to you whether you think it was a hit or a miss, but this monitor that you see right here came from this right here. And the slow, sloping roofs and all that kind of thing. That's where it came from. Yeah. Think about sculptures in the Tuxent Watershed. Anybody recognize that? Mm -hmm. That's the bridge to the Bowie Race Track. If you go over that bridge, one of these horse heads is on each side of the bridge on both sides. And then this is at the entrance to the Laurel Basement. Anybody recognize that? I'm going to show you a different example of that in a little bit. How about this one right here? This is a freeze that's over the entrance to the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory, which was opened in 1927. And what I like about it is that it shows a lot of the different types of animals from the Chesapeake Bay, including oysters, a rockfish, a terrapin turtle, right here in the middle, and a crab. And this is the logo of what today is the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And you can see it's a takeoff of that same freeze that's still on that building. But because they put it in a circular form, they took out the tariff. And I, to me, that's too bad that they did that. But it, it's still interesting. And then this, my friends, is the entrance to Cremona. And you can see on the left, Burford Cow, and here's one on the right. And that's what you're looking at right there. That's all that's left. And then, of course, Della Brooke couldn't be left out. So this is their, this used to be at their front entrance, which is now down on the waterfront, which is a marrow sheep. And they do a lot of growing of marrow sheep in that particular area. I don't know if anybody recognizes this. I personally would never say that this is the Patuxent River. But in fact, it was done by Max Watt, and the title is Evening on the Patuxent. And if you're not familiar with Max, this is a portraiture of him. And this is his exhibit that was at no other than the Corbin Art Gallery in 1929. And many of the paintings that he did are of the Patuxent River. And the particular painting I'm showing here is privately owned by someone who lives within the Patuxent watershed. The only other painting that I know of that is owned in the watershed is by the Marlboro Hunt Club, which originally was called, anybody know? 
Patuxent Honey Co. And they have one of those paintings hanging there. Any of the sculpture work look familiar to anybody? Do you ever think you would see something like that in the Chesapeake watershed? If you go to Greenbelt, you'd see it. And what's interesting about it is that this is Art Deco. And it was done by Nor Thomas Strauss, who has an interesting background. The community center in Greenbelt is considered one of the top 10 Art Deco style buildings in the entire United States. Very few people go there. They do have a museum there. And I'm not going to read any of this to you except to point out to you that if you thought some of this might look a little bit like it's Russian art, in fact, Ms. Strauss was Russian. She was investigated by the FBI because she admitted that she was part of the Communist Party. But you can go throughout the United States today and see examples of her work beyond just in Beltsville, but you can go to Accokeek, Maryland, you can go to many post offices throughout the United States. You can even go to the Foothill Islands in Norway, and there's some sculpture right there by this man. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a new community that's maybe about one-third completed right now. It's called the Refuge because it's located immediately adjacent to Patuxent Wildlife Refuge. And when you walk into the visitor center, there's, they call it a sculpture. I don't call it a sculpture, but this is a detail of it down here. And it's showing you the central portion of the watershed. And it's been carved in such a way that when it rains lightly, the water will flow down the channels of the Patuxent River. If it rains too hard, it gets flooded, just like the river gets flooded. And if it doesn't rain enough, it doesn't, it doesn't spill at all. But it's just an interesting concept. If you're ever up that way, you might want to stop by and take a look at it. I think everybody here is well aware of this particular sculpture. Interestingly enough, I happen to know the guy who stood in to be the waterman, who's not a waterman at all. It doesn't even come from the Patuxent River, but it's still it's a great sculpture. Anne Marie Gardens, if you're not familiar with it. Um, how many of you knew that there's a um, U.S. Color Troops statue in St. Mary's County over in Lexington Park to all the black soldiers that fought in the American Civil War? Um, there's just sculptures and art all over the place. The Little Patuxent Review, I don't know if any of you have ever read it, but it has poetry, it has literature, art, it's very interesting. Did you know that Scribner's Magazine the cover of May 1907 was the Dewey Dry Dock. It was tested at the mouth of the Patuxent River. Did you know that if you go to Fortune Magazine, September 1936, there you see the ghost fleet that was anchored at the mouth of the Patuxent River? So there's all of these tie-ins that people who live here, for, for the most part, don't even know. There's even a music group called the Patuxent Music. I'm not into abstract that much. But I find this painting a little bit interesting because on the back it says Skiff and Rover, Meadow, Olivet, Maryland, and then the name of the artist. So this is obvious from, from Olivet, which is down near Solomon's. And if you don't know the artist, his name is Rolly. And the Calvert Green Museum has a very large collection of Rolly paintings, many of them from Solomon's and other parts of the Tuxedo River. Some of his paintings are held at the National Museum of American Art. They're at the Corcoran Gallery of Art, Library of Congress, the Arts Club of Washington, Columbia Historical Society. Uh, it's, it's just interesting. My favorite Bay artist is Louis J. Fuchter. And this guy was interesting because he primarily was a designer in silver. And he worked at the famous Kirk and Sons in Baltimore. So a lot of the silver that was designed and produced there was designed by this guy. But he also loved vessels in the Chesapeake Bay. He did many, many paintings uh, in the Solomon's and Patuxent River area. The Calvert Green Museum has 34 pieces of his works. And as far as we know, it's the largest public collection of Fugger's works that exists anywhere. And this is just to give you an example of some of the work that Fugger did. This is the U.S. Heavy Cruiser Maryland Silver Service, which is on display in the state uh, courthouse up in Annapolis. And all of these different scenes 
were sponsored by different counties, and then each county would depict what they would like to see on the silver souls. So for example, in Calvert County, one of the things that's depicted is Preston on Patuxent, the famous manor house that many people consider one of the earliest homes in Maryland. These were all designed by Fugger. So if you ever get to the State House and you see this exhibit, hopefully it will have more meaning to you. Because it was an artist that also did watercolors and oils, but he also did things that are apropos to the Patuxent River. If you're familiar with a great manor house called Bill Reagan, uh, this is one of the greatest uh, plantation houses really in Maryland. It's all private, it's very difficult to get in there. But that's also depicted on the silver service. So. Okay, I'm probably going to be running out of time here, but that's not unusual for me. Um, I also have a chapter where I include folklore, humorous stories, things that are probably completely apocryphal, but they all relate to the Patuxent River in one way or another. And to me, it's one of the most interesting chapters in the entire book that I'm writing on. This is an illustration that shows one of these apocryphal things where there's a story that when the British were coming up the Patuxent River, the people on the shore would take saplings and they were tied to these saplings, bundles of wool or cotton. And they would put different types of liquids or tar or whatever on them, light them afire, and then send them out onto the vessels. There's no evidence of anything like that ever happening. But these are the kind of stories that will be in that particular chapter. <coughs> this is interesting to me. This is 1935, and this is from the community of Sandy Spring. You guys may be familiar with Sandy Spring. It's Montgomery County. And in 1935, they had a club that was called the Neighbors Club. And they were concerned about pollution in the Tuxedo River. Was it safe for us to swim in the river? And so they took it to the health official of the county. This is 1935. And the health official came back and said, yes, the river is polluted, but I don't believe it's sufficient enough that it should keep you from swimming in the water. 1935. Now look at this. Cool Springs of St. Mary's, Charlotte Hall. Probably everybody in this room has been there. If you haven't, it's an interesting place to go. And they claim, I've not been able to research this yet, that there was a hospital there that was noted because of the purity and the medicinal qualities. We hear this from all these springs all over, how it could heal people. So here's your historic marker. And to the right, this is a sign that was up as recently as 15 years ago that said the water is not safe for drinking. Now that shows you some change that's going on over time. So you have to worry a little bit about the health of the river. And many people don't realize it, but the Patuxent River has been used as a sounding board for the health of the Chesapeake Bay. And that's why different governors and people like Louis Goldstein and all of these different politicians that we have here have frequently tried to get people to come down and be aware of the issues that we have. There's a whole chapter just on the environment and some of the concerns about the Patuxent River. I put this one in because I want people to help me. This is the Kaolite Mine building that was located near Lyons Creek. And I've never been able to get any photographs of that mine in actual operation. I know there's got to be some out there. So if any of you have any contacts or know someone, please let me know. Because all I have is this showing the factory after it had been abandoned. I've got some others, but they don't show the actual working, and I would love to be able to get some of those. Okay, just some highlights. Grace, you cut me off when you want to. Um, did you know that there's two geographical places in Antarctica that are named after the protection? Now, you might ask yourself, why would that be? How do you think many of those scientists got to Antarctica? They got there on planes from the Tuxent Naval Air Station and crews from the Tuxent Naval Air Station. And they were so appreciative that when they went out and did their scientific work, they named different places after the Patuxent. Now, they were probably naming it after the air station, but I'm going to say it's after the Patuxent. <laughs> Geological formation of Maryland, Patuxent. A new species of amoeba named after the Patuxent. 
and this is the cover of the publication, 1921. A new species of earthworm named after the Kentucky River. 2002, it came from Jabe. Is there another river in the world that has an amoeba and an earthworm named after it? No, there's none. I mean, it's amazing. We could go on and on and on, but I know I'm getting too late. Um, we have ships named after the Patuxent. This is a barge named after the Patuxent. Here's a tugboat. Miss Patuxent, I've already told you about that. Did you know that there was an oiler in the U.S. Navy fleet named after the Patuxent? They have their own badge. And here's the, here's the oiler right here, getting ready to refuel and resupply this vessel. And this is what it looks like. This is a huge Navy ship. And then my favorite is how many of you know there's a pilot boat that operates at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay to pick up pilots and drop pilots off? It's named after the Patuxent. And it used to be right here at the Mint Station in Solomon's, Maryland. But they moved it down there. And you can go anywhere in the watershed and you're going to see Patuxent, Patuxent, Patuxent. I like this one right here. This is the radio station. WPTX, it has great music, highly recommended. And then I hope this is not an omen. But this is not an omen. But the oyster boats at Sotheby's, dying breed. Crazy, I'm almost done. Remember I told you that it's getting close to azalea time? This is a photograph of the azalea gardens at Brighton Dean. It is a wonderful place to visit. I highly recommend you do it. And then this is the closing quote from Will Statch, and all I want to say is at the bottom he says, but the Patuxent has its points of interest. It is well worth knowing. And I think all of us that live in this watershed, we know that to be a fact. And this is the last image, and I love this image. This was taken by Tom Wisner. And this is on the city of Crisfield. They're going out to dredge oysters. And he was able to get this picture of men adjusting the rig right in the middle. You have a drum point lighthouse. And Tom Wisner, as many of you know, was the bar of the Chesapeake. He was a personal friend of mine. I'm sorry that he's gone. But that's the closing image for my presentation. I thank you for your attention. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And if we have time for questions, I'm happy to do that as well. Thank you all very much. So it was a true carrier. And while it was in the Patuxent, they turned it into a cattle ship you know, because they no longer had troops on the board. So what that meant is that the British soldiers would go out and bring in cattle, and they would slaughter them, and they would put the cattle on the vessel, if you can imagine this, and then kill them. I mean, the, the decks would have been full of intestines and blood and all kinds of stuff. And it was anchored, and the anchor apparently got stuck and they couldn't get it out, so they just cut the ropes. And then the U.S. Navy was doing some ordnance testing, and they picked it up on metal detectors. And so they raised it. They didn't know what to do with it. There was no Calvert Marine Museum at that time. So they gave it to the Mariners Museum down in Newport News, Virginia. And that's where it is today. And I can tell you when I was director of Calvert Marine Museum, I pestered the hell out of it. I wanted to get that baby back because that anchor was in sight of where the Calvert Marine Museum is, but they would never give it up. Wow. But, I mean, it's just the way it goes. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, Ralph, you had a question, a comment about the civil war that was done by uh, Portugal. And uh, there was a, uh, what of the estates was on there? The um, president? Preston on, on, on it. Yeah, No, when I say Preston on Patuxent, yeah. that's the brick house that the Cumberland's on oh. down on the water. Now, the truth of the matter is, Preston on Patuxent originally was a wooden house. And it burned in 16, if I remember correctly, I think it was 1654. Mm -hmm. So this house dates from after that, probably built on the same foundations or near the same <clears throat> foundation. 
it's still a very important early house, but it's not the original Preston House. And that's always been referred to as Preston on Patuxent, because Preston, that's Richard Preston, the Quaker, also owned land on Calvert Cliffs. And that was called Preston on the Cliffs to differentiate. And it gets more complicated than that because there were writers like Footner that came along and changed the name to Charles Gift, which is not. And so it's very, very confusing. But its, it's formal name is Preston on the Tuxedo. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, when we first moved down here in the uh, 70s, the Cool Springs in St. Mary's was called Dense Cool Springs. And that's now been removed, and since I'm a dent, it was, it was kind of this. Oh, times are changing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's still worth to go there. Yes. I mean, I think it's still a pretty area, but it has changed a lot. There was yeah. actually a brick building that was built over the spring at one time. Right. And so it's, it's changed so many times. If you go back and look at the earliest records, it was not one spring. It was several springs that came out. So. Ralph, will you repeat where she was talking about? We couldn't hear it. I, I couldn't hear the question. But I just didn't hear the location. That, uh, oh, the, you're referring to the one at Charlotte Hall? Yes. Yeah. So it's the same one that I was talking about in the presentation. Yes. Essentially where, uh, have you ever heard of Three Notch Road? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the extension of Three Notch Road. And you guys all know the story behind that. That's one of the oldest roads in the state of Maryland. And it's called Three Notch because that was how you, you cut three notches in the trees so that you knew where you were going. But Three Notch actually meant that this is where you turn off to go to a ferry. So three notches would be different from two notches. And so that was actually, to me, a, a misnamed road because Three Notch Road is not one of the turnoff roads. It's where the ferry roads all went to, but they were not the individual ferry roads. Okay, well, thank you all very much. Have a good evening.